empowers individuals to recognize early warning signs, fostering timely diagnosis and treatment. Additionally, it promotes research funding and support, essential for advancing our understanding and improving the prognosis of this devastating disease. Before we start, let us take the blessings of Ma Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge. So let's commence today's program with the auspicious lighting of lamp. Technical team is requested to please play the video. <laughs> Now I request Vice Chancellor S. B, Dr. Upinder Dhar to virtually welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Rene Jean Bensadon with a bunch of flower. And I would also like to request Dean Faculty of Sciences, Dr. K. N. Guru Prashad sir to welcome our guest, Dr. Praveen Arne. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite Dean Faculty of Science, Dr. K. N. Guru Prashad, to deliver the welcome address. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Navnita. It's an honor to welcome our guests today on behalf of uh, Sri Vaishnava Vidya Pitch, Vishwa Vidya Lang. We extend our welcome to our guest from France, Dr. René Jean. He's a radiation oncologist and chairman, Center of Energy at NICE, France. And we also have another guest uh, not visible on the screen yet. Uh, Dr. Yeah, he's now there. Dr. Uh, Praveen Arne from uh, University of Buffalo, New York. Uh, both are specialists in uh, oncology and they had a uh, conference yesterday in uh, Cancer Hospital. And uh, they are here today with us in the university uh, for delivering this online uh, talk and uh, also inform uh, people here in the university uh, who are not actually working on oncology, but uh, who understand oncology and also uh, particularly the topic which uh, has been chosen for this talk. And that is the uh, translation biophotonics. Uh, now, uh, biophotonics uh, in the Department of Biotechnology in the university 
Science uh, Institute, the Vaishnava Institute of Science, uh, is quite aware of this um, biophotonics uh, and uh, how the techniques in optics have been employed for both uh, the diagnosis of cancer and also in the uh, therapy, of, uh, photodynamic therapy, which is being used extensively now for uh, cancer treatment. Uh, we need to understand that researchers in basic sciences, particularly about how the molecules that can be excited with light radiations can work for our benefit in controlling the cancer is uh, a basic science research that has been now adapted in uh, medical sciences. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary area. All the new researchers in optical imaging and optical radiation uh, have now been uh, used in medical sciences, especially in the treatment of uh, uh, cancer, because uh, cancer continues to be the disease which uh, puts a scare in the minds of people even now, uh, unlike other diseases. Uh, although the new techniques are now available and many types of cancer are curable and uh, it is good to see that uh, when people are detected with cancer, doctors also now write that it is a curable cancer. So that's a very uh, good uh, kind of uh, putting confidence in the people who are affected by this. So we will know more about um, um, biophotonics and we look forward to increase our knowledge about biophotonics from both our uh, guest uh, speakers. Uh, thank you and welcome you once again to the university. Thank you, sir, for your insightful remarks, which provide an ideal foundation for commencing the program. Today we have with us Dr. Praveen Arne as our guest speaker on this occasion. I feel extremely privileged and honored in introducing him. Dr. Arne, is a versatile, multi-talented professional with a diverse background in dentistry, oral pathology, and biomedical engineering. He previously served as an assistant clinical investigator at NIDCR and now holds the position of associate professor at the University at Buffalo, New York, with an impressive track record of more than 125 scientific publications and multiple prestigious awards, including the National Institutes of Health Young Investigator and recognition from the America, American Society for Laser in Surgery and Medicine. His expertise extends globally. Dr. Arne's impact is evident through his extensive involvement in scientific journals, editorial boards, and grant reviews. Along with his leadership role, in Photobiomodulation Therapy Association. He boasts six patents, an H index of 35, and global media recognition for his impactful work. We believe your knowledge on cancer is invaluable, and we would like to invite you to speak on the topic. Over to you, sir. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. It is busy, yeah, all right, great. Thanks. All right, let me just hide my controls. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for inviting us to present on our talk today. Uh, it's been a great two days at Indore, and we really enjoyed our day yesterday at the Cancer Center, where we were um, exposed to a lot of good research and clinical care that's occurring at Indol. Um, in continuation of that theme, uh, because besides science, it actually takes many societal factors to move a field forward, uh, we thought we would also talk a little bit about the other aspects of clinical translational biophotonics. And uh, so my talk is going to be based on how research that we are doing in our uh, unit at Buffalo, but also in other places, 
are able to move this field forward. So I'll do the first talk on introducing that topic, and then Professor Renijan will actually take over and do the clinical part and the research part of what photobiomodulation is. So um, I understand that the audience is very broad. There are uh, students of commerce, students of engineering, and social sciences. So uh, I thought I would start with a very simple introduction. Let's see. Not going forward. There we go. Okay, great. So I come from uh, the state of New York in uh, in in uh, United States, and as we were talking just before we started this talk, every time you say New York, people think about this beautiful city, right? So everybody knows New York City, but New York is a very big state, and if you can look at the map of uh, New York State, the New York City is a very very small part of the actual state, and it's at the uh, southern eastern border. While Buffalo, where I come from, is actually at the western border. And the thing that Buffalo is really famous for, uh, besides Buffalo statues all around the town, are the falls, Niagara Falls, which is also very well known uh, around the world as one of the wonders. So we are just 15 minutes from Niagara Falls. And uh, our claim to fame is that we invented Buffalo wings. I'm sure a lot of you who are non-vegetarian enjoy chicken. Uh, buffalo wings are famous uh, and were invented uh, in a in a in a restaurant in Buffalo. So that is that is our claim to fame. Now the topic that I'd like to talk to you today is about translational research, which is how do you do basic science research, whether you're looking whether you're looking at single cells such as yeast cells here, whether you're looking at frogs, flies, fishes, mice, or primates. The goal of this kind of basic science research is to try and move the information and knowledge we get from this research into patient and clinical care. So today we'll talk to you between me and Professor Benzadown. We'll talk to you about how we have taken light treatments from a basic fundamental understanding of how molecules and light photons interact to the actual use of these treatments in clinical patients. Uh, just a little bit of background about what my lab does. So uh, as uh, uh, the professor introduced us, we, I have a background in biomedical engineering and biology. So my lab works on all of these different aspects of a basic science lab. And we work in teams. So I'll show you some pictures of my lab. Uh, this is what my uh, actual lab looks like. We have lots of 3D printers, which is right on the top there. You can see those various different kinds of 3D printers that we use. Uh, we do simple things like aligners and splints for surgery, uh, for implant. Uh, I'm a dentist by training, so we use it for those kind of uh, clinical care. But we're also doing a lot of research in terms of developing new scaffolds or next generation scaffolds that can direct um, bone marrow stem cells to form different kinds of bone drafts. Uh, as you can see in this image here, we do a lot of molecular biology, biochemistry, and uh, basic fundamental research stuff. Now, the thing that's unique about my lab is that we do a lot of uh, light-based research. And uh, the images that you see here show you images of both surgical lasers, which is these kind of lasers, and non-surgical lasers, such as the ones here. Uh, and these are what we would call surgical diode lasers, which can be used for both uh, surgical procedures as well as non-surgical procedures. So most people are very familiar with the cutting lasers. Uh, you think of LASIX in the eye of how we improve vision. Those would be these kind of lasers here. While the diode lasers are extremely popular in dentistry because they have a small footprint and are much more affordable. So that is what uh, my lab looks like. This is a current image of my lab about four months old. And as you can see, we have people from all around the world, uh, people from China, people from India, obviously. Uh, Brazil, uh, Saudi Arabia, and there are so many countries I can't keep track. But yeah, so we have a very big group. Uh, this is an image of the group about four months ago. A lot of them are dental students because we are in the dental school, but we also have medical residents as well as other um, biochemists, chemical biology, chemical engineers, as well as uh, computer scientists in my lab. So here's an image of a research festival that we attended recently. And a lot of the students actually got different awards, which is great. This is just an image of my uh, chair who actually recruited me and some colleagues. So it's not that we only do serious science. We also have a lot of fun in my lab. So 
So I thought I would introduce very briefly two aspects of my lab that are complementary to what we do with light. And uh, the first part of my lab obviously is focused on biology. And uh, here's a simple example of the kind of experiments we do. We take cells, as you see on top here, these are dental uh, uh, stem cells that we have actually shown in this image. And then we stain them with different dyes. This particular dye is called mitotractor green, which stains the mitochondria. And this is another dye called Mitosox Red, which measures reactive oxygen species. So you can see that, as you see at the bottom, there are numbers showing you increasing laser doses. And as you increase the amount of laser dose, you get more ROS in the system. The images at the bottom show you some kind, uh, some of the protein work that we do. So that's the crystal structure of, uh, not the crystal structure, the outline of the growth factor that we work a lot with. It's called TGF-beta. And when you do uh, different kinds of treatments, you can actually activate this treatment. And this is a technique called a Western blot or an immunoblot. And you can see that when you do light treatments, this particular protein can activate signaling. And when you make different mutations, uh, these are single uh, amino acid mutations, you can see that this um, mutation causes the laser activation to go away. So uh, what we would classically call a biological loss of function study. So we ask questions in the lab about can light activate specific molecules? And as you can see in this image here, uh, very quickly, I showed you data showing that light, a physical form of energy, can actually convert into a chemical signal, which is reactive oxygen species, ROS, which I showed you in the image on top, is detected by these fluorescent dyes. And then it can act on specific biological molecules. In this particular case, TGF beta 1 is a growth factor. Now, because you can activate a factor with light and light alone, you can actually do some very cool stuff in the lab and as well as in your patients. So here's an example of how we take oral keratinocytes, which are basically epithelial cells in the mouth, and we put them on a plastic dish and we make a scratch. So the scratch you can see here is a wound that is created. If you watch the scratch over time, you can see that the scratch is closing, showing us that there is wound healing occurring in that plastic dish. When we actually put um, laser treatments, in this particular case, a 8, 10 nanometer low power laser, you can see that the amount of healing that is occurring is significantly more. So there are still gaps in these wounds, but you can see that this wound has completely healed when you do the laser treatment. In other experiments in the lab, we also look at, if you know uh, wound healing, that's how you, when you get a wound, your epithelial is closing from both sides. So if you look at these, epithelial forming units or stem cells in the skin, you can see that the number of stem cells, these little dots that you see here, it's easier to appreciate this on the graph. Every time you do laser treatments, the black graphs are, the number of stem cells are significantly increased. So not only can you get better wound healing, which is shown on top by cells migrating quickly, you can also increase the number of epithelial stem cells, thereby improving wound healing. So here are more experiments where we do burn wound healing. And if you can see this animal uh, has created, we have created a third degree burn wound. And this is the normal healing response in uh, mice that has been subjected to a burn wound. When you do this light treatment, which I'll go into a little more detail and Professor Benzadown will talk extensively about uh, photobiomodulation, you can see the amount of accelerated wound healing that is occurring here. We also do other kinds of uh, transgenic animal studies. And this is a very specific transgenic animal study where we have substituted the growth factor isoforms. And when we make this very specific chimeric animal, you can see that the light is incapable of activating the signaling. You can see the activation here. And when you cannot activate this growth factor as shown here, you can see that the amount of healing that was increased with PBM is not occurring here, showing us that a very specific experiment can show us uh, the response of a single molecule that is being activated with light. So this is one part of my lab. And the second part of my lab does a lot of work with biomaterials. And as dentists, we are very good at making fillings and crowns and dentures and implants. So we do a lot of research in this space. And you know that materials have become very, very sophisticated. They are uh, biocompatible. They have to be biocompatible but they can also be very important for various kinds of functions. And these are some examples of both orthopedic, uh, cardiovascular, as well as dental uh, materials that are used. 
So one of the studies that we are very interested in doing, and this has been published already, is to make antifungal dentures, right? So dentures, uh, as you probably already know, are unfortunately prone to getting infections with candida, which is a fungus. So what we have been doing, and this is work done by two dental students in my lab, who have actually gone on to become faculty. They're now my colleagues uh, in the school. So they were, uh, this is Jacob uh, and Alex, and they were able to use the system to actually generate the ink that we use for 3D printing. And you're seeing basically, if you're a dentist, you know that we use PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. So we have made a PMMA ink that has antifungal agents in it. And this agent now can be printed so you can provide an antifungal denture to your patients. So I've gathered there are a lot of business students, commerce students in our audience as well. So this is just to show you that instead of just doing, you know, academic papers, uh, a lot of scientists now are starting companies. And based on that uh, antifungal denture, uh, my lab actually started uh, several companies, but this is one company that is focused on dental materials and it's called Optimate Technology. And the university actually gives us a lot of resources now to actually do these things. So our company is based on three products currently. One is the antifungal denture that I showed you. The other two are involved in uh, a toothpaste that we make. And um, these toothpastes are used to deliver a particular medication. Um, it's a, just a specialized, just like you have fluoride toothpaste, we have made a toothpaste that can fight gum disease in a very particular way. And then the other part, other product is a bone graft material that we are trying to accelerate uh, implant placement. So I will show you a brief video. Hopefully the video will work. Um, and then we can. So the purpose of showing you that video is we have several students in the lab who are actually MBAs who are not doing science, but they are trying to commercialize our science. And that was one of the products that we are actually trying to commercialize. Now, having showed you all of that, I'd like to move to the main topic that we actually wanted to talk to you today about, and that is the use of lights, right? And um, I'm sure you have seen Superman with his lasers, and there are so many Star Trek movies with lots more entertainment. Um, so light is a very unique physical constant. So when you think about where light is present at the highest scales, you are talking about distances between stars and galaxies. We talk in light years, right? And if you look at the very smallest scales, uh, the string theory of how matter is composed, you have this form of electromagnetic radiation that holds these subatomic particles together. So light is present at all different scales of the known universe. And most interestingly, uh, the field that we work in, we are interested in how light works with biological molecules, such as nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, and carbs. We also want to understand how this response that it generates in cells and tissues can be used therapeutically in an entire organ. Right? So both medicine, dentistry, physical therapy, acupuncture, and various fields of clinical care are now using light. When you think about the basis of how they use light, uh, this is probably the most important slide in my presentation. We think about how light energy is transferred into the tissue. If you transfer a lot of energy very quickly, it results in disruption of the matter. And that is how a surgical laser works. So if you're thinking, thinking about LASIKs in the eye, you're using a laser energy to ablate or evaporate tissue, and you can actually do surgical procedures with lasers. 
You can also disinfect by breaking up biofilms with thermal energy. In contrast to the surgical lasers, there are known non-surgical lasers, uh, non-surgical laser techniques such as photodynamic therapy and photobiomodulation. As the chair uh, introduced PDT, this is a very unique form of treatment where you can paint a target and destroy it selectively. In contrast to all of this, there is a unique form of light treatment that can modulate biological responses. And there is a massive clinical and commercial reason why this treatment will actually become very popular. So here's a slide that shows you all the various clinical diseases in humans that this treatment has been shown to address. There are diseases here like Parkinson's, yeah, like Alzheimer's and concussion, as well as pain in your back, in your knee, in your neck, as well as uh, ulcers in your mouth, mucositis and arthritis of the knee. So all of these are evidences from human clinical studies showing us that this treatment works very effectively. Another possible uh, treatment is photodynamic <coughs> therapy, where you can use uh, a very specific dye or a photosensitizer that can stain or paint your target. And in our case, uh, we do mostly antibacterial work or antifungal work. But there are people, as the chair mentioned, that can also do targeted tumor and tumor vessel endothelial cell targeting with this technique. The way this works, I should back up a slide, is this experiment I think all of us have done as children. So we go out into the sunlight, we use a magnifying lens and concentrate the sunlight, right? And then you can burn stuff and do some cool uh, uh, antics for your friends. So this technique, photodynamic therapy, is very similar, where we paint our target and then expose all of the tissues to light. The light is harmlessly absorbed by the non-painted targets, but the ones which have this chromophore or dye, the light will convert that energy into a photosensitizer, a reactive oxygen species, which can selectively target these cells. So you can selectively kill either a bug or a tumor cell with this approach. I mentioned photobiomodulation, and there is a lot of disbelief about how this treatment works. And uh, we normally are made fun of because how can you shine light and make you know people better? And we are not you know plants that can do photosynthesis. However, we point out that light has a very important role in human health. Everything from vitamin D metabolism, which you know occurs due to sunlight on your skin, your ability to see your environment, visible light that is converted into vision because of a which because of a protein in your eye called rhodopsin, as well as your circadian rhythm. You know, every all of us who travel uh, by aeroplanes, we know about jet lag and how our circadian rhythm is disrupted. Uh, we also know that light has a very important role in our psychological state. So this field has many, many different names, over 350 names. And in 2014, we had a meeting in Arlington, Virginia, uh, of the North American and the World Association, where we decided we would call this treatment photobiomodulation. And if you use PubMed, which is the National Library of Medicine database, uh, photobiomodulation is a mesh term that indexes the entire literature of this treatment. Photobiomodulation is defined by the National Library of Medicine as the use of a non-ionizing source of photonic energy that generates non-thermal therapeutic benefits. In our field of specialized treatments, we have a longer definition where we talk about different, treat, uh, different light sources, such as lasers, LEDs, and broadband light. And we like the term photobiomodulation because if you use a specific dose of light, you can promote positive processes such as wound healing and tissue regeneration and a positive immune response. And if you inhibit, if you want to inhibit a negative response such as pain or inflammation or an autoimmune or an aberrant immune response, we are using different protocols and different light sources. So um, I have two more slides and then I will turn it over to Professor Benzadown. Uh, I showed you this slide already about how there are so many different treatments so to the, for the engineers in the audience and the uh, uh, business people in the audience, com commerce students, there's a huge commercial opportunity to make a specific treatment for all of these diseases with this treatment, photobiomodulation. So I'd like to end my talk by showing you another video. Uh, we thought COVID is over and you know we are done with all of the pandemic, but looks like the game is not already finished. There is already uh, talk about how uh, it might be coming back. 
So let me just switch my screen to another uh, video. So let's watch a very brief video again about where photobiomodulation has shown to be extremely effective for COVID treatments. All right, so I will show you one last slide and turn it over to Professor Benzadan. So photobiomodulation has many, many different applications. We just showed you an image of, um, can you see my slides? Yeah, so, so uh, it's coming up. Okay, I think I can go from, from here. All right, here we go. So I just showed you, uh, uh, brief video of what it can do for COVID. And we have several studies on long COVID, which is also a major problem now. But what I'd like to end with is, I think the beginning of what uh, Professor Benzadown is gonna talk extensively about. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Benzadown did the very first study on oral, oral mucositis and photobiomodulation. And oral, oral mucositis is a condition that okay. can occur oral. in patients who have chemo or radiation treatment. Okay. And we have current guidelines now for treatment of mucositis with, with photobiomodulation. So, so I will turn it over to now uh, Professor Benzadown. There are, this is the world guidelines that have been published. And for those of you who are interested, um, there are other guidelines that are coming out. Um, I will skip that last part and thank all the people in my lab. So again, uh, we have a big lab. There's a lot of interest in commercializing our research and developing new prototypes. So with that, I will end and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very oh, much, yeah. sir, for sharing your expertise and insights on photobiomodulation. You explained the complex concept very nicely. Your talk was truly inspiring for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Rene Jean as our distinguished guest speaker on this momentous occasion. It is truly an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to introduce him to our esteemed audience. Dr. Rene Jean Bensedon is a radiation oncologist and professor in radiation oncology, currently work serving as the chairman of the Center de Horte Energy, Nice, France. He has a diverse range of interests in the field, including photobiomodulation, low-level laser therapy, head and neck cancer, prostate cancer, supportive care in cancer, and advanced techniques in radiation oncology. Dr. Rene holds significant positions in various boards and organizations, including Vault President. And he has received several awards for his work, including 2020 Senior Investigator Award for excellence in PBM clinical sciences. He has over 200 publications, including peer-reviewed papers and books, 
and an impressive H index of 50. He has made substantial contribution to the field of oncology. Additionally, he has secured various research grants, including a European grant for a new PVM randomized trial. Dr. Rene's expertise lies in patent care, research, education, and organizing oncology related events and congresses. I humbly request your esteemed self to share the profound knowledge and deep understanding on the topic, the light of cure, a new reality. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure and great honor to, to be here and to present to the University of Indo here uh, our data about photobiomodulation. As a radiation oncologist, uh, I will not speak about radiation, uh, chemotherapy, oncology care, but this new wonderful technique of photobiomodulation who came into uh, mainstream medicine now with a mature uh, attitude thanks to the lot of work that has been done during more than 30 years now. Uh, the Praveen one, is one of the main researchers in this field and, and we had a, now a clinical part of the research that is totally mature and we can have good guidelines exactly the same we have for radiation oncology where well, the dose is critical now we can produce a, a specific dose to a specific target to treat patients with this technique and the particularity of photobiodulation is uh, a is not the treatment of cancer for us is the treatment of side effects of cancer treatment beside many other indications outside oncology for uh, tissue regeneration, wound healing, dentistry, sports medicine, gynecology, dermatology, etc. It's a very, very big range, wide, wide range of indications. All of them are around tissue regeneration, analgesic effect, and anti-inflammatory effect. That's uh, now a reality. It was uh, for years totally empirical, but now we can produce guidelines and position papers that can really allow the dis all of us uh, in the medical centers to use this technique for the benefit of our, of our patients. So uh, I will be very quick in my presentation, not to be uh, too long. Uh, I would like to present mainly the clinical part. Uh, we had a workshop yesterday uh, that was really uh, splendid at the Cancer Institute with uh, even a technical part. Thing. And we'll have that in Manipal uh, from uh, today uh, to tomorrow and, and until the end of the week, uh, our annual Congress uh, with uh, a lot of attendees. Uh, I will show you first the different machines. Photobody emulation is, is using laser or LEDs, and we have this type of laser machines in the 80s in our center in Nice, and uh, now we, we are using more LEDs that are uh, much cheaper and with the same quality of, of beams that can be much more easy to use than a, a helium neo laser, for example. All the rationale of the treatment is based of different wavelengths treating at different depths inside the tissues. We we can this slide is very easy, and we can find on, on the world uh, site. Uh, the data about uh, dosimetry of this type of uh, beams uh, with low energy laser or photobiomodulation, we can treat lesion at different depths inside uh, the body. If we want to treat superficially, 
uh, with analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and regeneration of the tissue. We use red light for the first one or two centimeters. And when we treat in depth, infrared, uh, near infrared, with wavelengths between 750 and 830, should be used to treat with a amount of energy sufficient for uh, the effect. For years, we had, we had not this uh, real dosimetry, and we, we didn't give the right dose to the right place. And that's why the technique was not mature and what was not so effective than in vitro study. Uh, now it is totally different. So uh, now we have many, many indications. Uh, mucositis is certainly the main one where, where the evidence base is very important. More than 500 randomized studies, most of them being uh, of good quality, but some of them were negative and all of the neg negative studies, we did a meta-analysis in, uh, in uh, 211 and uh, all the negative studies were due to non-adequate dose on the target. Uh, for example, applicator divide by a factor of 1000 uh, the energy on the tissue and we had finally nothing on the tissue and the effect was done. And when you use the right dose at the right place, the effect is totally constant for all our patients both in with intraoral device and extraoral device leds like that here clusters of leds uh, five years ago we we were we discussed uh, did we have to to do again new randomized studies with leds uh, comparing with laser and finally not we have a very good leds of high quality we have the same range of those on the tissue and we don't have to perform again the randomized studies we did with low energy laser. So uh, when using intraoral device, dosimetry is quite easy. We, we give uh, an, an energy on a spot with a beam, not in contact with the mucosa, but uh, 0 0.5 millimeter from the mucosa with different aspects for bone bone transplant and it changed totally the, the tolerance and the cost effectiveness of, uh, of the treatment. And uh, of course, the feasibility of high dose treatment, I will show you afterwards. And now we have external device uh, that with a panels of uh, LEDs that allows with computer assistance a wide range of treatment, large areas. Here, for example, head and neck cancer. We can treat both the skin with red light and the mucosa inside with infrared light with a specific amount of energy in preventive effect and curative effect before and during radiation treatment and chemotherapy or targeting agents, for example. So this different slide shows the different aspect of head and neck cancer treatment with photobiomodulation. And the feasibility of the cancer treatment is much, much better. We were yesterday at the Indian Institute of Head and neck Cancer. The cure rate is improving thanks to this technique because we can give the full dose of radiation, the full dose of chemotherapy without breaks, and that's a critical aspect to cure the patients. We can go with uh, this technique deep inside uh, with external device. Uh, it's much more easier than with internal device to, to treat, for example, laryngeal area. And the same for a breast cancer here we, we can treat all the breast and uh, sub susclavicular area with an homogeneous dose we have to to be very cautious about the parameters 
I don't. I will not present all the different parameters, but of course we have the same precision we have uh, in radiation. The distance between the paddle and the skin is critical. Uh, the dose rate, uh, energy, irradiance, fluence, all these different parameters are critical. And then we have the clinical parameters of number of sequences a week, total number of sequences of uh, PBM. Is it a continuous treatment or a pus treatment for pain, for example? Plenty of parameters that we have to precise, and that's the role of our position papers and guidelines. The WALT is the World Association of Photobioration Therapy, and the main role of this society is to have a common way to treat with adequate protocols and controlled machine with the control dose. We have to, to give a, a specific energy on the target, not on the machine, and that's very important. We treat, for example, neuropathies. Neuropathies were uh, very uh, bad side effects of chemotherapy, and now with uh, PBM, we can regener regenerate uh, the peripheral nerves with a very efficient activity. The same for the fingers. Here, a patient with both neuropathies on feet and and mucositis on the oral cavity treated with photobiomodulation during chemo radiation. We have now whole body treatment to treat uh, the muscles. Uh, of course, outside oncology, we have many and many indications, and one of them being uh, the treatment of uh, mus muscular lesions for sports guys, and uh, it is now very popular in uh, soccer teams in Europe uh, with uh, a lot of machines uh, allowing soccer players to uh, go back on the field very soon after one or two weeks, and it was more than four weeks before. The same efficacy for dentistry with a uh, after extraction of teeth the recovery is much much faster with the photobiomodulation treatment here a tissue treating this with a, a panel of led we have no side effect of this treatment just wearing specific glasses to uh, prevent retina treatment exactly the same with the laser we are using for your slide presentations here a list of some indication of photobiomodulation in oncology for just for side effects of cancer treatment so the, you see that the list is very important and for all of this complication we have now studies in progress whether randomized studies or very nice big data studies to, to confirm that our protocol are efficient with the right dose. For example, when, when we treat trismus, opening of the mouth, we have to treat the muscles uh, of the face and the joint uh, between the mandibula uh, and the maxilla. And of course, this treatment has to target the right place. And when you have the right those on the right place, the effect is really fantastic with all the patients being improved. The same for lymphedema, late variation fibrosis, xerostomia, etc. And then even alopecia after chemotherapy. So the, the, the level of evidence is of course different between uh, the different uh, side effects. For mucositis, as I told you, it is now the first treatment the most evidence-based uh, is for photobiomodulation and it's the number one technique of treatment for radiation induced and chemo induced acute mucositis for post-radiation dermatitis both acute and late it is also level one it is a level two for peripheral neuropathies 
very very bad side effects but is really improved uh, for pain and for uh, quality of life with PBM, lymphedema is a level two, trismus, and we have also uh, randomized studies in many parts. And in our world society, we all have some studies in progress. And our collaboration with uh, Indian Institute of Edenic Oncology with Indo Cancer Foundation is already important and should be more and more important in the near future as the center of excellence in cancer supportive care. We are co quite confident in the future. There is only one uh, side effect that that can be that has to be addressed. Uh, it is uh, the potential proliferation of cancer cells, the safety. It is not at all a problem when we have the right dose. Uh, proliferation of cancer cells is only present for high dose, 20 fold uh, the dose we are using in clinical practice. But it is a very important aspect that, uh, that certainly uh, focus the role of dosimetry. We have to give the right dose. And if we give 20 fold the dose, there is a risk of proliferation of cancer cells. When we give lower dose, we will have nothing. That's another, of course, uh, problem. So we have to give the right dose. It's a range of dose. It's not so precise uh, that uh, the dose we perform in radiation oncology with uh, X-rays, but with photobiomation, it's a range between two and uh, eight joules per centimeter square, all over the surface of interest not only point by point. So we have several uh, studies in for safety around the world, but all of them are showing that there is no risk of uh, cancer proliferation in the range of the dose we are using. We had a nice uh, World Congress in this, my city, uh, four years ago, and now uh, the, the new Congress is in Manipal in the following days. Next Congress will be in London next year. As uh, Professor Arani uh, told uh, a few minutes ago, our first position paper for cancer supportive care was published last year. It was a four years work to, to initiate those uh, guidelines for each complication of, of cancer care. What should be the right protocol with PBM, the right dose to give, and the level of evidence now is quite important. I, do, I just speak about mucositis very quickly because it was the first one and we had a very nice uh, uh, literature review and meta-analysis in 2011 with our friends from Norway and Brazil. Bra uh, mucositis is certainly a, a wonderful, uh, example of uh, the way photobiolation can work because it is due to radiation oncology or radiation treatment of or chemotherapy is a very complex process uh, radiation and chemotherapy are producing free radicals free oxygen species and then there is a up regulation and amplification with different uh, cofactors around NF kappa B and it really it, it is all over the, uh, the different level of the mucosa through the, uh, from the epithelium to the connective tissues and with all this cofactor we have amplification and then ulceration and healing all these different phases are really well addressed by PBM. That's why we have such a, a big effect because all, because all the phases of mucositis are a good target for PBM. We have a, a good healing at the end. We had an, a few ulceration with no super infection and amplification is decreased. Initiation of free radicals are decreased. So in all the different phases, PBM is effective. 
and specifically when we use concomitant chemo and radiation, uh, the the results are really splendid. Our group in mask and in uh, world is uh, working for more than 25 years now, and, and it is really cost effectiveness. We decrease uh, the rate of hospitalization of uh, uh, antibiotics treatment of using of parenteral nutrition and so on. So we had several studies that showing that uh, it is really cost effective and most of it, the most important aspect is that it allows the complete treatment, treatment to be uh, done, all the radiation treatment, all the chemotherapy treatment, and we show in different, I will show you the, uh, the clinical effect uh, that um, for this very advanced cases, we need high dose of radiation, high dose of chemotherapy, and this high dose were only possible with uh, PBM without this uh, treatment. It was not possible to perform high dose radiation and high dose chemotherapy without breaks during treatment uh, with the total dose. And we show in the phase two and a phase three trial that it was totally dose dependent. The rate of survival was totally dose dependent. And those protocols uh, published in the 90s were uh, not performed during uh, 15 years because uh, they were considered as too toxic for the patient. And now we can do these protocols with a, a lot of cure of the phase four, uh, even the stage four patients, thanks to the use of PBM during the, all the treatment from the beginning to the end. And we have to prescribe uh, this type of PBM treatment. The same we prescribe radiation uh, where it has to be done, the field of treatment, the, the number of sequence a week, a total number of sequence. We, uh, uh, the position paper explain all that. We had uh, meet, meet, meetings in Nice in 2018 and then two online meetings due to the COVID. Uh, it was in 90, uh, in 221 and 222 last year when uh, position papers were presented. And uh, this year, at last, we have a face-to-face -face meeting in Manipal that will be certainly a big success after the symposium we had yesterday in uh, indoor with the Indian Institute of Head and Neck Oncology. Next year will be a big anniversary of our society in London, and it should be a, certainly a main congress to officialize the, the enter of photobiomination inside mainstream medicine. It's not at all a complementary medicine. It is really, uh, in France, it is entering radiation oncology, not to cure patients, but to prevent and to treat side effects of treatment. But we are using the same software, the same physicists' uh, assistance to, to uh, precisely given the right dose at the right place. The, the same we do in radiation oncology. That's why, as a radiation oncology, I, I am now the, the president of this society. So uh, I'm very pleased to quickly present you the, this wonderful new technique, uh, new by the quality of uh, treatment. It, it is old <laughs> when considering uh, the effect of light that was already uh, assessed 40 years ago, but, it, but we had for more than 40 years to come from the science to the clinical practice with a, a lot of evidence. And now it is really mature and uh, you will see that uh, in, the near, in the following years, it will be implemented uh, everywhere and specifically here in Indo with the Indian Institute of Agricultural Oncology that should be, 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 become a, a center of excellence for PBM in cancer supportive care. Thank you for your, your listening. And we are here to, to answer your question if any. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for such an informative session where you clearly mentioned about photobiomodulation in dentistry, where it harnesses light therapy to enhance healing and manage pain for improved dental treatment outcome. We are grateful for your valuable contribution as our guest speaker. Your words have left a lasting impact on all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much once again. Now the session is open for discussion. If anybody has any query, so you can please discuss with the sir. I had one thing to ask, uh, Professor. Uh, this uh, photomodulation, is it being used more for the treatment of the side effects of chemotherapy rather than uh, using it directly on the tumors? Yes, yes, it's not a treatment of cancer, it's a treatment of side effects of treatments. You have not to treat the tumor with photomodulation alone uh, because there is a risk as i said of proliferation of cancer cells at high dose so we have to be cautious about that but it decreases all the side effects that allowing finally to be uh, to have the best cure of of the tumor so it's uh, it's not a treatment of cancer it's a decrease of side effects that allows the total treatment to be given. It's, and that's really critical, specifically for head and neck cancer, because of the amount of side effects. So it's, a, it's of course, a part of the treatment, but this part is really, the name is supportive care. Supportive care is to support the treatment. It's not palliative care at all. It's to, to have the total treatment to be cured. Palliative care is, comfort of the patient it's not to cure the patient here we it's a complementary treatment to de to increase the rate of survival thanks to the, the decrease in side effects that's it thank you uh, i think our vice that has joined now uh, maybe if we can speak a few words uh, dr rupinder dhar Good afternoon. I'm thankful to Dr. RJ and uh, Dr. Praveen nice, nice for sparing their time uh, for making our students and faculty aware about the latest uh, findings and breakthrough in cancer treatment. And I'm sure that as more data comes and more evidences are uh, reported, PBM is going to be one of the landmark uh, areas for treatment of head and neck cancer. So it was a pleasure to listen to both of you again today. Although I could not attend from the beginning, I am traveling. But thank you very much for joining and uh, making all of us aware about the latest in the cancer treatment. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, sir. There are questions from any other any student or faculty? If anyone have any query. Thank one you so much. To, just a minute, one more query to Professor. Uh, although you said that, you know, it is being more and more used for treatment of uh, side effects of cancer, but there are some researches where they have been used even for the direct treatment of uh, tumors. Perhaps private, yeah. So not not for tumors, but for specific chronic diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, concussion. Um, they do we do not recommend that as the main treatment, but it is a big part of how okay. we're doing treatments for these diseases now. So, so uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, specifically, there is significant evidence that this will improve the clinical symptoms okay. as a main part of the treatment protocol. Um, how do we know that? As we have several clinical cases. Uh, mm -hmm. human studies that have shown benefits but, but in the lab what we are able to do is take animals and induce the disease with a very specific toxin uh, as you know parkinson's you can use uh, mptp and the animal actually will get the tremors that resemble the disease mm -hmm. or you can use mog and induce ms like symptoms where the pay, where the animal will actually get chronic pain similar to multiple sclerosis 
and by using light treatment and light treatment alone we are not only able to reduce the amount of clinical scores of the disease but there is a change in systemic markers such as cytokines and their histology uh, for example in parkinson's we actually look at the dopaminergic neurons and we have seen that they actually recover uh, when we do the light treatment so, so uh, dr guru prasad डॉक्टर chemicals also which can produce the same type of reactive oxygen species uh, by true. chemical treatment uh, have we done any uh, comparison between the two yeah. yeah so we have done several studies where uh, yeah. one of the most common uh, ros that we are especially as dentists use is hydrogen peroxide right so hydrogen peroxide is readily available we use it for all kind of disinfection and other destaining procedures So we have actually done several studies where we have used an ROS inducing agent in place of a laser unit, and we are able to re- replicate all of those studies. Uh, we have also done experiments where we have taken the light treatment and added ROS scavengers such as vitamin C, ascorbic acid, or yeah. an acetylcysteine, and we can completely negate all of the therapeutic responses. Um, and just because you bring it up, I think uh, ROS has both a good side and a bad side. Normally, when people think about ROS they're thinking about cancers and aging where ROS has been shown to have a bad role what mm-hmm. people don't realize is that very low amounts of ROS is critical for normal mm-hmm. endothelial function cardiovascular function as well as your macrophages and neutrophils that mm-hmm. use them in the lysosomes so it becomes a question of dose and as it was reinforced in yesterday's uh, uh, fantastic symposium uh, we are actually following a lot of the ayurvedic principles where a lot of small amounts of ros yes. are actually shown to be beneficial right so, so that's, that's where we are with this treatment yeah uh, 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 you know we are working with the same kind of ros and uh, antioxidant uh, treatments and other things but only uh, not in the animal tissues but with the plant tissues so yeah. it has almost the similar uh, effect certain beneficial effects but it can also become toxic at certain Absolutely. levels in certain and, conditions and and then we we always try to make the point in lot of our research that even water and air oxygen which are essential for life can kill you right wrong amount in the wrong place can be lethal so just like that i think we are doing light in a very controlled amount and dose yeah so there's a question for dr benza down i believe okay. you like to take that yes. okay yes, yes dr benza Yes, it's really a matter of dose. It's uh, and that's the great progress we had in the in the last years, where uh, the definition of the good dose to the right place to have the effect. Uh, because we had many data in vitro or in animals during years, but we had no effect on the human beings, and that's what because we didn't target uh, the, the the right place. uh for example for neuropathies we have not uh, the good dose on the nerve uh, and now we have some software we have some clinical uh, measurement that uh, really uh confirm that we are giving the right dose right dose rate on the target and that's a fantastic progress for the effect of this uh, treatment thank you dr vance we i have read somewhere that um, pbm therapy mm-hmm. is useful in controlling diabetes also but yes. i am not uh, clear how Who would you like to elaborate with yes it, it's really simple it's it, it's you increase uh, wound healing which is the main effect the first effect that was uh, uh, yes f- found in the it was at the end of the 50s by uh, dr mester in hungary was uh, one healing and diabetic ulcers and if, for this type of ulcers we increase uh, the healing and we dec- decrease the super infection 
uh, we had a, a case uh, last month of uh, uh, very big ulcers on, on the two. It was intended to be uh, uh, removed the two, and uh, with a daily treatment with a PBM, we allow the patient to have a total healing of the ulcers and with no removal of the two. So uh, that is our day-to-day -day practice. It's uh, it's really so effective and but the the way it is working is now very well uh, assessed with uh, the, the one healing being being a very uh yes scientifically proven uh, effect uh, beside analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect perhaps pravin you can add uh, some words about <clears throat> so I think you covered everything about wound healing. The other thing that you get in diabetes is uh, neuropathy, yeah. right? And and we know that this treatment works both for chemo-induced but also for diabetic neuropathy. So there is evidence now that we can use this treatment to relieve uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, along with, which also causes the wound. So it, it, it can help with that as well. There are some uh, rather, I would say, rather controversial studies about controlling the blood glucose directly. And uh, I'm not sure I can believe all of that yet. Uh, so I don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Dar, if you're referring to the metabolic well, disorder itself, yeah. that there is no evidence that diabetes can be directly cured with this treatment. Yeah, does it mean that uh, PBM involves direct uh, on the glucose? No, no, there is no. no evidence that it can, there is no evidence it affects the insulin levels or the blood glucose levels. Okay, okay. thank you. Only complications of diabetes. That, that has been... Any other question, issue. please? Okay. Yes, that's so much. Okay, doctor, now... Effect. Yes, there, there, is, there is a question, uh, about the effect of no on normal cells, uh, there is no uh, possibility of uh, transformation of normal cells in cancer cells with a PBM. We just Im have some risk at high dose to to have a proliferation of cancer cells, but not creation of cancer cells. That's very well assessed. So for, on normal cells, we just have a positive aspect. The word photobiomodulation is the way we modulate the metabolism to come back to the normal metabolism. So it's it can be increasing some uh, some uh, action, decreasing in some aspects, but the, it is to come back to the homeostasis. So sometimes you are it's uh, increasing on, of some. Uh, action, for example, uh, uh, yes, uh, metabolism of around ATP on my mitochondrial, but in some situation, yeah. it's an inhibit. Okay. So there is there is some uh, uh, in terms of metabolism, there is some uh, literature on how PBM can help with weight loss. Uh, and the evidence for that, you know, they have made these beds and they have made these belts that you can use. Uh, the evidence at the molecular level suggests that it cannot make the lipids or the fats disappear, but it does increase the mitochondrial activity as Professor Benzadown is pointing out. And therefore they are better able to metabolize those uh, constituents. But there is no evidence that it can directly cause a change in the blood glucose level, insulin level, or for that matter, the lipid levels. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Benny and Dr. Praveen for informative discussion and clearing the doubts. I would also like to thank Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Upinder Dhar to join the event during the journey also. Your presence is always gives motivation and encouragement to us. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Supriya Vyas, Coordinator, ICF SWV Chapter, to propose words of thanks. Good afternoon to all.
Thank you is such a prayer that cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt by heart. On behalf of Sri Vaishnav Vidyapit Vishwavidyane, I, Dr. Supriya Vyas, Coordinator ICF Estabalvi Chapter, feel honored to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks for this event. First and foremost, I want to extend my sincere and heartfelt thanks to our distinguished speakers, Dr. Rini Jean Bansadong and Dr. Praveen Arne, for joining us today and sharing their profound insights during this webinar. Thank you, sir. I would like to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Vindar Dhar, Vice Chancellor Estipal Bindor, for giving permission to organize this program and for being a constant source of motivation and the guiding lamp for every new step forward. I would also like to convey my deep appreciation to Dr. Dikpal Dhakar, Surgical Oncologist and Honorary Secretary, uh, Indore Cancer Foundation Charitable Trust, for his uh, uh, unwavered support and timely guidance whenever it was needed. Sir, I hold immense respect for you. As a special note of thanks goes to Dr. Santosh Dhar, Dean Faculty of Doctoral Studies and Research, Dr. K. N. Guru Prasad, Director SBIS, Dr. Anand Rajavat, Director SBIIT, Dr. Namit Gupta, Director SBIKS, and all respected directors, heads, and faculties for their generous support, without which this event would not have been possible. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work, hard work and dedication of our technical team who ensured that the webinar ran smoothly from start to finish. Lastly, I want to thank my fellow team members and volunteers who worked to plan, promote, and execute this webinar flawlessly. As we conclude this event, let us carry forward the inspiration and knowledge we have gained today to make positive changes in our life. Once again, thank you all for being a part of this wonderful event, and we look forward to future opportunities to come together. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Supriya ma'am. Now yeah. I request everyone to kindly rise for the national anthem. Thank you all. Super. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharata bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Uttkala Vanga Vindhya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladhi Taranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Janagana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you very much, Ajay and Praveen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you, sir, for joining from your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Guru Prasad, kindly attend to them. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vanson, joining you. Yes. Thank you all for joining the event.